Hi, my name is Talia. Welcome to Talia Nerds Out. Just trying to adjust the, the computer a little bit. There we go. Um, hopefully, third time will be the charm for this. The first time I recorded this video, I didn't know until afterwards that my computer randomly decided not to recognize either my um, in-computer microphone or my in-computer speakers. I had to completely restart the computer to have it even recognize that those things existed. But when I went back to look at the video, of course, because the speaker was not recognized when I had recorded my 45-minute video, it did not record with sound. I tried again using a, an ex a different camera that I use for my knitting podcast and a tripod in the room where I usually do my knitting podcast. Well, that didn't go very well either because I actually ended up flaring really badly like I sometimes do when I record. Like, I too often do as I, when I record in that room. So that video I will not be showing to you unless this one does not turn out well because no one needs... If I can avoid it, I don't want to have yet another video of me flaring out there. <laughs> There's more than enough of those on my knitting podcast. We don't need them on BookTube as well. <laughs> so hopefully third time is the charm. And it's if it sounds at all not stale, but if it does happen to sound not quite as excitable as I usually am, or a bit more organized. Yeah, what a concept. Uh, it'll be because this is the third time I'm doing this, and in some ways it might be more organized, but in, the other, in other ways I might not remember what I've said this time, <laughs> what I said the first video, and what I said the last video. So I might get all confused in what I have said and what I still need to say, just because all three videos are probably going to start merging together as I start speaking. Let me take off this layer. Okay. So, let me just reach to the side here. What I really wanted... Sorry, I got a bunch of new books. I got a Malcolm Gladwell deal, so I got a bunch of those. So, those are taking up space over here. There we go. Um, I believe in my last video that I mentioned that I, actually I don't need this marker in here anymore, but that I was reading Egypt's Golden Couple, and this is a book, hang on, I don't want to take the, turn off the mouse because all I need is to like accidentally hit something and then no longer have sound, I have to do this a fourth time, <laughs> okay, so last time I mentioned that I am reading Egypt's Golden Couple when Akhenaten and Nefertiti were gods on Earth. And I believe during that quarterly, um, that mid-quarter update, I believe that I mentioned that there are aspects of this book that I take issue with. Those issues that bothered me only bothered me more and more as I continue to read. I'm not sure if I mentioned it last time. I'm pretty sure I did. But this book is authored by a husband-wife team. She teaches art history. Um, and she does curate a major mu museum exhibit on Egyptian revival art and design. Now he, so her name is Colleen Darnell. His name is John Darnell. And he... Uh, he is a professor of Egyptology and has also had his expeditions to Egypt covered in the New York Times. He's had his, um, one of his Egypt, his Eastern Desert expedition discoveries um, of the earliest monumental hieroglyphic inscri inscription named one of the top ten discoveries of the year by archaeology. So, and they've also been presented on Discovery Channel, History Channel, Science Channel, 
the Smithsonian Channel, and National Geographic's Lost Treasures of Egypt. So they have the qualifications behind them. Unfortunately, I'm not sure if they just don't know how to present their arguments in a way that is convincing, or... Because I'm not doubting that they have the expertise. And when they focus on Egyptian art and it doesn't feel like they're pushing any particular theory super hard, then I'm able to really get into it because they do have a lot of knowledge to share, particularly on Egyptian art. And that's probably partially a lot to do with Colleen's uh, input because of her art uh, background, her art history background. Now, my biggest issue, I did think I mentioned this in the first video, is each chapter begins with these fictional representations that are supposed to lead into whatever that chapter is supposed to be about. Unfortunately, the chapters are fairly short, so there are way too many of these fictional Vignettes. Um, now they do mention, I believe it was in their forward, might have, it might have been in forward or an introduction. Um, regardless, it was it was mentioned at some point early on in the book that these fictional pieces are uh, inspired by pieces of art found on pottery and tombs, etc. And I don't doubt that the germ of the idea came from something based in history. My problem was that, first of all, it was a bit jarring to be going from reading something that was purely intended to be, this is the facts, you know, this is, you know, these are, these are evidence that we've got to show. You know, things are very much based or supposed to be based in what actually is or what is thought to actually be but these fictional accounts were a very different tone they definitely felt like historical fiction which is basically what they were what they are and I didn't I don't want that in my history books that's not what I thought I was going to be getting I thought I was going to be getting a pure the history book and if it had been like, oh, let me just have this once to illustrate a point. But that's not the way it was. It was every chapter. And there are, let's see how many chapters there are. There are 31 chapters. And I can't remember if there's one uh, vignette for the epilogue as well. So that's 31 to 32 short stories that weren't. I mean, they were, oh, I'm sorry, there was one for the prologue, too. I forgot about that. So, okay, so, I'm sorry, uh, 31 to 33 short stories. And the short stories, I mean, they were at least, some of them were longer than others. They could be anywhere from a page, I want to say up to a page and a half. I don't think they went longer than that. If they did, it was only a little bit longer than that. Um, but this was quite frequent in the book, and the chapters weren't terribly long. This book, if you don't include, if you stop when the actual uh, book finishes, you don't go into the acknowledgments, you don't go into, you know, what everything, like the footnotes, all that, uh, this book was 286 pages of pure content of the um, of the meat of the book, what most people are going to read. So to have that many chapters, you know, that many short stories in that space, I thought was a bit excessive, and I thought it it felt like padding that could have been used better. What? Do I mean that the padding, the space for the padding could have been used better? What I mean is that 
there were definitely areas that I, that I felt while reading that they could have done a better job proving their point and disproving other people's points in order to, since they did come with a definite theory, they didn't just say, here are the facts, you make up your own mind. They came in strong with what they, the story they built in their minds about what the archaeolog archaeological evidence pointed to. So, yes, they had their fictional stories, but they also had the story they were building up in their mind of what the historical evidence was saying. I mean, I mean, and to be fair, the book I read before, this was a 1998 book, I believe, uh, by Dr. Bob Breyer, Breyer, anyway, uh, The Murder of Tutankhamun. He also built a story that he believed to be true based off the evidence. Now, he did, whether you could argue one way or another, whether or not it was mostly a, you know, a half-hearted attempt to either disprove his theory or to um, look into other people's theories or other possibilities. But he did address the fact that there were these other possibilities and he did try to go through them point by point. Um, and he also did acknowledge the weaknesses in his particular theory, even though he admitted that, you know, this is the one I still hold to. Now, I believe he has changed his position on that in the most recent book that he put out for the, I think it's a 100-year anniversary of finding King Tut's tomb, which was 2002. He has another book. I just didn't feel like reading that one right after reading this one. This book was written in 2002 with everything, like I think there was just a whole slew of books that came out about um, that whole late 18th, mid to late 18th dynasty due to the founding of due to the 100-year anniversary of the founding of King Tut's tomb. But, unlike Dr. Breer's book, where he at least gave me the feeling that even though he was definitely had a theory and definitely had a bias I felt like I could point out, I did at least feel like he attempted to address other possible theories in a way that felt more than dismissive. Um, I do not get that feeling with the Darnells. The Darnells did this in a couple different areas, but the main area that I can think of it that really got me irritated at first, started me getting irritated, was they mention that... Actually, let me see if I can read you this, this spot because it really did bother me. Um, so, um, so, it's a bit of a longer section. Okay, I don't want to read the whole section. <laughs> um, basically, hold on, there we go. Let me go ahead and put my, let me make sure I still have sound because that would be distressing if I don't. Okay, I still have sound. Good. Let me go ahead and make sure that my screen doesn't shut off because sometimes it just randomly goes out and I don't understand why. Um, okay, there we go. That should keep it from going out. Okay, anyway, back to what I was saying. I'm not going to read you the full thing because it's actually multiple, multiple paragraphs long and I thought it was shorter than it was. I'll just summarize. So they're talking about the artwork representing um, the Armana period. Um, so that is the elongated heads, the spindly bodies, the gut, the widened hips, everything that we associate with the art of Akhenaten and his period. Now... There was, they did mention several of the theories. One, a, a couple of theories that were mentioned were things like some people, 
thought that parents marked uh, Akhenaten as a eunuch. Uh, some thought that there might be, and this is one of the theories that Dr. Breer mentioned, was that um, Akhenaten might have had Marfan syndrome, which, if you did go down that path, which is something I mentioned in my video, with Marfan syndrome being a genetic condition, if there was intermarrying like there seemed to, there was in that family. I mean, we see it with King Tut and his wife, Akhenaten Moon. There were brother-sister marriages. So if there was a brother-sister marriage between Akhenaten and Nefertiti, or even cousins, you could see potentially everyone in that family having that gene. Or something that I believe I discussed in that video as well, it could be that he, only he had the gene and maybe a couple of the other kids, but he felt so insecure about it that he it became a hallmark of his period that that was the way the artwork looked. Everyone looked like that because he wanted to normalize it. So that was a theory I had thought had some benefit to it, um, as did Dr. Breer. I had mentioned, I believe, that it could have been purely an artistic choice, but then um, what cha helped change my mind was this photo of the skull of Tutankhamun. That is the elongated skull that is was typical of the royal family in the, in the Amarna, yeah, I can speak, in the Amarna, Amarna period. And it is a, a symptom of Marfan syndrome. So that was something that once I saw that, I was like, well, this theory could actually have some legs to it. Now, in mentioning all these theories, that skull was not brought up by these authors, which I did think was kind of a mistake because I thought that if we're going to be talking about the reasons that these, uh, the, the reasons that we can be seeing these differences in appearance in art, if there's an elongated skull and we have evidence of an actual elongated skull of a family member, then... I feel like it's a mistake not to address it at all. But they mentioned that the most reasonable conclusion is that the art was a form of religious and political expression. And they, they go on to mar mention different changes that you see throughout different times in the dynasty. They mentioned Akhenaten's uh, parents who... Um, d developed in their artwork almost childlike features as they were reborn in, as manifestations manifestations of Sagan's own youthfulness at dawn. Then they mentioned the artistic gender transformation of the female king Hatshepsut. Now, there are definitely other things going into that for her because she, and this will come into something I'll be mentioning later, because she was able to, as a female who was also the ruler, she was able to, in herself, represent the female part that was thought to be in the, um, they're supposed to be part of, I believe it's the creation process, and then the male part of things, because she's already female in, in who she was, and as a ruler, she could, with a uh, false beard and everything, she could take on the male aspects as well. So for her taking on that transformation, that artistic transformation, it did definitely have its own purpose that isn't necessarily starting an artistic movement, but... Um, and they talk about how she starts off looking fe fully female, and then as the art developed, her images change to be more androgynous and even um, eventually more masculine. Um, and I have to check and see, but I believe when she was absolutely more feminine 
was, I think she had a son who was alive at that point, who she was ruling as, um, oh, I couldn't bring up the term last time I recorded this, and I can't bring it up now in my brain. Um, uh, she was ruling until her son took his majority, which I know there's an actual term for that. My brain's not supplying it right now. It will come up later, hopefully. Because I know what it is, I just can't remember it. So I believe that was the case, but I can't remember for sure because I'm actually not terribly well-versed in chipset. Um, hang on. A warning just came up. Let me make sure I still have sound. I'm now, like, completely freaked out about it because I don't want to lose video. I don't want to lose this video just like I lost the last one. The last, the first one, and then the last one wasn't so great. Anyway, so I had to check and see because I'm not completely sure. I thought that that, that she was um, ruling with her son in the first part of her reign. So she had someone taking that male aspect. Um, yeah, there it is. Co-ruler Toothmosis, who was then a teenager. So I'm right. At the beginning, um... Well, I guess at the end that he was... I'd have to look more into this. Um, I I would think as she took more of a different image that did maybe represent more of the power that she had. I don't know. I'm not terribly well-versed in her um, stuff. But hers definitely had a political thing going on there. And I think that's their argument with um, Akhenaten... And Nefertiti. The problem is, I wouldn't necessarily take issue with the argument. Because yes, you can put, point back and hatch up at the fact that she used a more androgynous appearance to emphasize that she um, had em emphasize the fact that she is the ruler to emphasize just dis different political things as an Egyptian ruler that you needed. Um, and that his Akhenaten's parents before him used art to show a certain political message, religious message that they were trying to go, bring across. I don't have issue with the theory. What I have issue with, what I take issue with, is the way that they choose to address other theories. So the Darnells present what their theory is based off of other pharaohs' artwork, which is completely fair. Um, but then they say, the artistic transformations of Hatshepsut and Amenhotep III are indisputable evidence that Akhenaten and Nefertiti's physical metamorphoses were not the result of pathology. I have a problem with that. Because with that one word, indisputable, they don't ever again address anyone else's theories in regards to Akhenaten's appearance. I'm sorry. You had a, a good, a theory that did have something, you know, that you could work with, that you could argue for. But it doesn't make your theory look any better to claim it's indisputable and then just not even attempt to disprove the other theories. So I would have liked to see them address the skull of Tutankhamun. Why was that skull elongated? Now, if we didn't have that skull, I would have perhaps, well, I would still want to like the word indisputable because unless you are actually looking at Tutankhamun, at an Akhenaten and a Nefertiti in the flesh, you can't necessarily say, you know, or even look at their, if there are nothing, if you're looking at their remains, or even looking at them in the flesh, and if you can say, okay, based off of them physically, there is no evidence of this, so it's indisputable there's you know nothing to point towards this okay 
Even then, I don't like the term, you know, instead of you go indisputable, because there's always room for dispute unless you can 100% prove that someone else's theory is wrong. And then I just think that it's only professional. Uh, I don't know. It only, I think it just is... Um, yeah, I guess professional is the way of saying it. it. In choosing not to even attempt to disprove other people's theories, to only point at the aspects of the evidence that support your theory and refuse to acknowledge aspects that might support others' theories, I think it shows a certain level of either arrogance or bias or both. Because you, it seems like you've just deemed that your evidence, your theory is better than the theory and or evidence that the other um, scholars had. And therefore, you know, don't even look at those other theories. This one's indisputable. So I, I didn't like that. That got my back up. And not just because it was a theory that I liked or anything like that. I just... It's, it's intellectually lazy, <laughs> um, in my opinion. Um, maybe they're just bad at writing or providing. I don't know. I, I feel like they should be able to do that. I, I will go more into something that addresses this particular mode of doing things later on. But they do this kind of thing more than once, where they will make statements, sweeping statements, and they won't put a whole lot of effort into proving those sweeping statements. Or they will provide in the footnotes that I don't know that everyone reads footnotes. I do. But the average reader, and I'm assuming that you're, they were aiming this at the average reader because I don't believe that most readers who are anticipating reading a um, more scholarly work, one that's aimed toward the, you know, not the general population. This book felt like it was aimed at, you know, someone who might have watched a documentary on Discovery Channel or the History Channel and been like, huh, that Akhenaten guy kind of sounds cool. I've heard Nefertiti before. Let me go and pick up a book about them. And that's what the stories at the beginning of each chapter kind of made me feel like that was the audience that they were trying to appeal to. So I felt it was even more important to go into depth in your main body of text to prove or disprove your theories. Now, I don't think they ever did. I'm looking at the first, a cha at the first chapter for that just because I want to make sure that I am pulling out my receipts. Um, so that would have been... Actually, they don't have any footnotes for that. So no footnotes for the section I have issued with in that part. But for another part where I took issue, they did have a footnote. And I will explain the situation and then go into the footnote. But the fact that they only tried to explain themselves more in the footnote kind of bothered me because it... That's not where the majority of your readers are going. And I just feel like it looks better. It's more professional as a historical, as a historian, as, a, as an Egyptologist to support your theories within the body of your text when you know you're dealing with people who will not necessarily be reading the footnotes. Because the, that audience might be more inclined just to take you at your word because you said something. Which, yeah, I kind of take issue with not providing that information where they would more likely access it. Anyway, so what's my issue, in, my next issue <laughs> with this book? Like I said, I, or I maybe mean, I didn't say it. Once they just focus on the artwork instead of feeling they were pushing their personal theory on Akhenaten and what the art said about him, 
physically, I actually started getting more interested. Even though I got really interested, it irritated every time the fictional pieces got, came up, I was getting interested in what they had to say about artwork of the time period because it was interesting. They definitely have an enthusiasm and a knowledge in this area. But my next issue came when they were talking about the daughters of um, Akhenaten. And the daughters in particular they were speaking of were um, Merith, hang on, um, Meritaten and Anaxipaten, who eventually became Anaxan Moon and, Mer and was the uh, first wife, the great wife, the the wife of Tutankhamun. Actually, I think she was the only wife of Tutankhamun, as far as we know. But one of the theories goes as such that there, let me see if I can find, um, the most extreme modern portraits of Akhenaten accuse him of causing the death of, Me of Mekhetaten, the princess perishing she gave birth to baby sire by her own father. But nowhere are the daughters buried in the royal tomb given the title king's wife. And they said the evidence most cited for Akhenaten's sexual relations with his own daughters are reliefs that show Meritaten followed by a girl named Meritaten Tasheret. Meritaten the Little Junior with corresponding reliefs depicting Anaxipaten and a child, Anaxipaten the Little Junior. The father of these junior princesses, according to some scholars, could only be Akhenaten. Now, the next paragraph goes that these princesses and the company of their namesake progeny are surprising, but they, they, the authors say, look at where you find this. You find this, and this is what the next paragraph after that says, you find this in the sunshade um, of Kai, which was a second wife or concubine, I'm not sure if we know which she was, of um, Akhenaten. Now, Dr. Breer, wrong book, but it's on my lap, Dr. Breer had the theory that Kai was actually Tutankhamun's mother. Um, the Darnells don't believe that. I This isn't particularly important to this discussion, but I just wanted to mention that uh, other theories about Kai in particular. But... Um, there was something called the Sunshade of Kai, and where her image and the image of, apparently she had a daughter named Bakataten. At some point, their images were, like, scratched out, removed, and replaced by that of um, Anaxipaten or Meritaten, sometimes Nefertiti, but it sounded like it was mostly the two, the two daughters, and then the young daughter, Bakatatan, was replaced by these junior uh, Anaxipatan and Meritatan. Now that took, so from what I first told you about the beginning about the, th uh, the theory, was about one, two, three, four, four and a half paragraphs. That everything I just said was in those four and a half paragraphs. The next paragraph bugged me. The sculptors who removed the name of Kai replaced her name with either that of Anaxipaten or Meritaten, like I just said. Instead of hacking out Bakataten entirely, her name is replaced with the name of a non existent daughter of the princess who usurped Kai's image. Thus, Anaxipaten replacing Kai appears with a daughter labeled Anaxipaten. To share it, the little, a small version of herself. The evidence of Anaxa, of Anaxatin's, I'm sorry, I'm reading that wrong, of Akhenaten's <laughs> sexual predations with his own daughters vanishes as the junior princesses are revealed to be artistic phantoms. Do you see what my problem is with this? I will be elucidating on this in case you were curious. I know you weren't, but you know. Uh... <laughs> I, too, obviously like the sound of my own voice, or the sound of my own theories. Anyhow, my problem with this 
is not the theory. Again, I don't necessarily have an issue with the fact that they have a theory. My issue is the fact that they demonstrate really poor, in the body of their work, they are horrible at proving their theories or making their theories even seem reasonable. I mean, where do you get from to share it means junior little princess to get going like, these are fan- just phantoms. That's just it. They're phantoms. I didn't have to, you know, there's nothing else to point to the fact that they're phantoms, but they're just phantoms. Got that? Cool. You got it. That, that's just not enough. It just really seemed like this huge jump. Jump. It, I, what I would have liked to have heard were multiple things. First of all, what, where did this theory even come from? Like, does, is there, just like they, sh- they, they made a point of, at least they made a point of showing evidence of other changes in artistic renderings with Hatshepsut, with um, Akhenaten's parents. Um, at least they made the effort of that with the, where I had problem in the, earlier in the book where they just didn't bother disproving anyone else's theories. But at least they had a line of evidence. They had historical um, precedents to point to prior to the period of time that their theory was. If I would have liked to have seen them point to that here. Was there any other precedents of there being artistic phantoms of... Um, non-existent daughters. That just felt a bit, where did this come from? So I looked in the footnotes, where like I said, I don't think a vast majority of your um, casual reader of a history book will necessarily look. But I went and I looked in the footnotes, and they referenced one work, It was written by a Spanish scholar. It's so I went and I actually looked up the work and his name and everything. It's only in Spanish and it's not all about, first of all, I couldn't access it, but it was a very small part of the work um, from everything that I gathered from what I looked into. The, The work was about, um, Uh, um, Akhenaten. It wasn't about this particular theory. It was about Akhenaten as a whole, and this theory was a small part of that general work. Uh, Let's see. This. uh, Let me see if I can find the... Sorry, I'm trying to find so I can go through with you guys what their source was. Okay, so... They have this under the section about their biographic essays. And they said that Anaxipotin to share it and Maritotin to share it are phantom daughters. See Labory, and the work is Akhenaten, and it says 314 to 22. So the whole work is called Akhenaten. It's in Spanish, and that's the only source. I could find nothing else. I can't access the work, but I'm sorry, even if you have another source... Explain why that source came to that point. Not everyone is going to go down the rabbit hole and follow your source to make it make sense. Because the way they presented it didn't make sense. So I just, again, there's a couple instances where I just feel like they either just expect the reader to believe them. They're just too biased to see that they're not really making things clear. Or they're just too arrogant. I can't decide which it is. Maybe it's, I'm, I'm going to go on the side of like kindness, I guess, and be like they're biased and just don't see that this is not something that makes, follows through for everyone else because they did not make it clear why this was such compelling evidence for them. Why we should even believe that these phantom daughters are a viable option when it could just be as viable 
if Tashir was a common way of saying that that was your daughter, why should we not actually believe that? Especially since, I believe I read somewhere else, that there was a case of Amenhotep, I'm probably saying that wrong, of Akhenaten's father having had daughter wives at some point. So if his father had daughter wives, and whether or not that's a actually a appropriate understanding of whether or not this mis mistranslation, it was, I believe, somewhere in this work stated, I know I've read somewhere, that there, there was, I want to say it was here, but there's at least been a theory of there being daughter wives for Akhenaten's father. But if that's the case, then it's not outside the realm of possibility for there to be the same for Akhenaten. If, you know, if you are going off of the whole thing that to share it can mean that's that person's child. So, yeah, this was something I wished that they had elucidated, they had explained more, that they'd actually taken the effort to not just be like, just believe us, this is Phantom Daughters. You know, don't don't look at any other theories. We're not going to bother disproving those really. We're just going to say ours is better, and that's the one you should look at. Because this source you can't read <laughs> unless you speak Spanish. And actually, even then, I couldn't get a hold of it. I tried to look at where to get it from Goodreads. Because I tried first to go to, I, I can't remember if it was ResearchGate or where I went to try to access the article originally. And I want to say I could only, well, first of all, it was in Spanish, so I couldn't read, I, I couldn't read it. Um, I mean, if I pulled out a dictionary, but there's going to be colloquialisms I'm not necessarily going to know. And I'm not going to call up my Colombian grandmother and be like, hey, can you read through this with me? Because you totally don't have anything better to do. <laughs> um, but regardless, I, um, it wasn't a full piece if I did even find the actual piece. I can't remember now. Um, it would have only been an abstract. I know as much as I didn't find the full piece. If I found anything, it was the abstract, which um, if you're not familiar with uh, scientific um, articles, a lot of times there will be an abstract at the beginning um, or an abstract that is released that will be like, okay, this is basically what we're talking about, and then you're supposed to click further to see the full article where you actually see their, um, how they came to their conclusion, what evidence they, uh, they pulled together to actually make them come to whatever conclusion they came to, that either this requires more study, this disproves whatever theory we came into the test with, or this proves what we came into the study with test with, or this brings up more questions. So that's what the bulk of the article that is not seen in the abstract shows. But if I was able to see anything, first of all, it was in Spanish, second of all, it was an abstract. When I went to Goodreads to try to, because it looked like it was a book, not just a, an article. I'm not sure if they were selling the article as a book, which I have seen journal articles sold that way because there's been a couple I wanted to read that I can't access because they're way too expensive um, when they're sold on Amazon. But Goodreads didn't have a link for me to go and find this. So even if I wanted to go and attempt to translate the thing, I wasn't able to get access to it anyway, which is why I really even more felt that a good historian, a, I'm not saying they're bad historians, I mean, I do think that they obviously have their credentials behind them. I just... I don't think that the best necessarily are presenting their theories in a non-biased way and in a way that takes us along on the journey. Anyhow, I'm beating a dead horse. There's a couple other points where they say things and it feels like they just jump to a conclusion without necessarily going into it enough. They mention a theory that Mara Totten was the pharaoh right before um, to Tinkhamen, and they didn't really, for one thing, from what I gather, when I researched that, uh, apparently it is a fairly controversial view, 
Um, that's what I got from the little bit of research I was able to do that it was fairly controversial. And I didn't feel like they went into enough uh, evidence about that. I felt like it was a little bit... Just they just kind of threw it out there and decided that was we're just gonna that's what it is. It's maritime. Now they did mention a few things that were interesting, which could point one way or another. I'm not sure that they made enough of a point that it was maritime versus Nefertiti. Apparently, in female names, if you have a T in certain areas of the name, that points to more of a feminine person versus points to a female versus a male. So, um. But they, they did re reference the fact that it could have been Nefertiti, but they, um, they don't really provide a whole lot of evidence that it was Maritotten versus Nefertiti. Or they just, they aren't the greatest at providing evidence that is compelling, in my opinion. So yes, I didn't really enjoy this book very much in points where they were trying to press theories because they seemed to like theories that were a little less mainstream, which I don't mind. But if you're going to profess non-mainstream the uh, theories, I really think that it behooves you to really um, support your theories because what you're representing is not the mainstream. And, um, yeah, it's... It requires a bit more to convince others. So this is a 2022 book. And while I was reading this, well, I was so frustrated because I really was getting annoyed at the, with the authors. I went ahead. I've been enjoying Guide de la Badoyer's books. And I did go to Time Team and look up how to pronounce his name. I'm not still not sure I'm pronouncing it right, but I'm going to go with it. Um, so... It, I saw that he wrote a book on the mid to late 18th century pharaohs. So it's called Pharaohs of the Sun. And I already know I like this author. I enjoyed his book, Domina. I enjoyed the book I listened to that he wrote on the Praetorian Guard. I feel like he is a pretty much, he's, he is an unbiased author for the most part. I think if I found any bias, it was very little in um, any of the books that I read by him. So when I saw that he wrote this, I was like, yes, I need to read this. I think that it will provide me one more camera view into this time period so I can better form my opinion because I've got Dr. Breer, Dr. Breyer, Breer, whatever, his opinion here, I've got the Darnells over here, like really opposing areas from each other. So I'm hoping I drop... Uh, Dr. Bedwayar, actually, I don't know if he's a doctor. I'm assuming he is. Guy de la Bedwayar over here. I think he's a doctor. Hang on. Okay, so he um, studied Egyptology as the first part of his degree. Um, he also... First part of his degree or this first degree? Let's see. As a part as part of his first degree. Um, what it mentions about him in the back is that he's written multiple books. Gladius, the World of Roman Soldier, Domina, the Women Who Made the Imperial Rome, Praetorian, and The Real Lives of Roman Britain. I've got that one coming in. Um, he's well known to a wide audience because of 15 years he participated in Channel 4's archaeology series, Time Team. He's a fellow of the Society of Anti Antiquaries and lives in Britain. Um, so, every time everything I've read by his uh, by him feels like it is balanced. So I've started his right away. What he said, and this was something that I really appreciated, was that he emphasized that there is an issue with within um I'm trying to pull it up. Oh, here we go. Oh, this I want to bring this up because we're actually having a conversation about this right now in um 
in the Discord for the Historathon. And he has something saying, Egyptian society was controlled by a collective culture conspiracy, locked in a timeless and reassuring recycling of custom characterized by oppression and exploitation. There is no point in judging a Bronze Age state by modern standards. The inequality was normal for the period and taken for granted as such across the region. Monarchical power was absolute. Opposition and protests were virtually non-existent because that way of life was ex accepted as the price of security and stability. Um, the difference is that in Egypt enough evidence exists for us to be able to see this happening in a chronological and historical framework and early stage in development of modern nation. So I always appreciate when an author makes a point of saying, hey, this is what the period of time is. This might not line up with what we consider in our modern times to be good, appropriate, moral, whatever, but we can't, putting morals upon them that, we can't judge them based on ourselves. Um, we, I mean, we can, it's, we have to be careful when we judge them. We have to look at them in the context of their times. Yes, there are some things that are always going to be bad actions and all that, but uh, the good historian the, lets the reader make that judgment and doesn't do that in the work itself. And uh, I always appreciate when an author mentions something about not judging the people in the time period because I know he's not going to push his personal opinions about the era or the person, his personal judgments of them on me. But the next part, which I actually meant to bring to your attention, was this paragraph. The nature of the evidence, as so often with the ancient world, means that speculating to some extent is unavoidable, unavoidable, but relying on it is a particular issue with Egypt. I hope I have kept mine to a minimum. Too much speculation interweaved among and even overwhelming the evidence has an unfortunate habit of being unintentionally read and treated as fact, even by those responsible for it. This is what I think happened to the Darnells. They believed that their evidence pointed to a certain area, based their speculation upon that, and then presented it as fact. And I guess because they believed it to be fact, they didn't believe they needed to really prove that to be fact. So I appreciated that as well. He made a couple of points I really enjoyed in his foreword. Now, I'm not... Actually, I'm farther along than I thought. Um, he mentions different things. He had, He's the one who addressed the male-female aspects that a ruler was expected to have associated with him. And with a male king, it wasn't an issue because he had a female queen, so that covered both of the aspects of ruling. Uh, but with a female king, because they didn't have the term queen the way we do, they... Um, didn't um, they didn't need to have necessarily another female. She could represent both. So I thought that was interesting. And I'm paraphrasing, but I thought that to be very interesting. Let's see um, if I could find. But there's so many things in here that I'm not terribly long, far along. But every point, I'm actually, I only highlight usually or write in books usually that I'm just reading for fun if something irritates me and I just write in like, uh, this is what, uh, what's driving me mad, making me mad or whatever. Kindle books I'll do a little bit more if something interests me. This book, I have not, I'm only 33 pages in plus the introduction. I've highlighted so many different things in here just because of the interesting things that he's bringing up. And it it's things about the language. It's not anything that ever feels like it is a theory or an opinion. It feels like it's based off of knowledge that we have. And he has no problem saying like, hey, we don't necessarily, like this is what we think. 
this may, there is some question about this because of translation issues, because of this issue, because of that issue. There's issues informing theories about this because of X, Y, Z. So already very early on in this book, I feel like this book is heads and shoulders above, um, well, this, it's above this book, which again, 1998 even though I really like Dr. Breer, and I will read his other one when I have the brain power to get to that again, and once I'm not in the middle of a historathon, where I'm going to have to move on to next quarter pretty soon. Um, it's head and shoulders for sure above this one, which I was not terribly impressed with, in case you couldn't tell. So I'm really looking forward to this. I need to pick up my pace if I want to finish it by the end of the quarter. So I do need to do that. I will get off of here now and do that. Not to mention, this light's starting to hurt my eyes. And I really don't want to get a migraine for tomorrow. So, yeah, I will see you guys uh, tomorrow. Hope that you lasted through my rant. And, not tomorrow. <sighs> guys, I will see you when I see you. <laughs> and, yeah, hope that you weren't uh, too... But I, I'm interested in seeing what you think about this, about these rants. I hope that you were able to follow my thought process that wasn't too jumbled. Um, and yeah, for, what are your theory, What are your feelings about how authors present their theories within historical works, particularly something as far away as antiquity, where there's even less evidence than during medieval times? So what are your thoughts about that? Uh, about having authors express their opinions about whether how much they should support it, if it's fine just to support it in the footnotes, if they should support it elsewhere. Sound in with your thoughts. I know I have a lot of opinions, but I'm sure that y'all do too. Thank you very, very much for joining me. God bless. Bye.